Good morning. My name is Loretta John Zarens, and I am part of the pastoral team at Trinity Lutheran Church in Hamilton. Welcome to Midweek TLC, a time for morning prayer and reflection. Thank you for joining me this morning here at the Hermitage Ruins in Dundas Valley. I've chosen this location for morning prayer today because it is quiet and away from the noise of the city. Hopefully, we can experience the beauty of nature and some silence this morning. From now until Advent, Midweek TLC will focus on Celtic spirituality, specifically Celtic prayers and John Philip Newell's book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. Each week, a member of the pastoral team will introduce us to the writings and teachings of a Celtic mystic or poet from the ancient to the contemporary. We will learn about their lives and teachings and how their wisdom can teach us today, especially when it comes to nature and creation. Each week we'll engage in a Celtic morning prayer liturgy to help us open our eyes and our hearts to the challenges facing the earth today and how we can be part of the renewal of the earth. So bring your prayers with you each week as we'll have time for silent prayer, at which you can bring your prayers before God. Now let us take a moment for silence and reflection before we begin. Take three deep breaths to help you center for prayer. In our gathering, envision yourself encircled by the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our opening sentences this morning were written by Christine Sign of the God Space community. I arise today, present with the Holy One, in the embrace of love, in the hope of renewal, in the joy of belonging to the great I Am. I arise today in the life of the Creator, in the image of the Eternal One, planter of gardens, bearer of burdens, breath of the world. I arise today a child of the Faithful One, lover of souls, reviver of spirits, blesser of all that is good and true and praiseworthy. I choose to live today in the name of the Caring One, compassion in my heart, gratitude in my thoughts, generosity in my deeds, justice in my passion. I choose to live today in the light of Christ. Amen. Our opening prayer comes from Sounds of the Eternal by John Philip Newell. Let us pray. In the silence before time began, in the quiet of the womb, in the stillness of early morning is your beauty at the heart of all creation, at the birth of every creature, at the center of every moment is your splendor. Rekindle in me the sparks of your beauty, that I may be part of the splendor of this moment. Rekindle in me the sparks of your beauty, that I may be part of the blazing splendor that burns from the heart of this moment. Amen. Our reading today comes from Genesis chapter 1, from the message. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature, so they can be responsible for the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them and said, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Last week, I gave you an introduction to Celtic Christianity and spirituality. I'll be using a variety of sources to create the weekly Celtic liturgy of prayers and readings. Each week we'll lear be learning about a Celtic mystic or poet
from John Philip Newell's book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. Today we are going to learn about Pelagius, who lived in the late 4th and 5th centuries. But before we learn about Pelagius, we need a bit of background to what was going on in early Christianity in the first few centuries. The Celts, also known as the Gaels, are first found in recorded history around 500 BCE. They lived in Europe, covering the whole of Middle Europe from what is now Turkey to the Atlantic coast of Spain. They were a loose federation of tribes sharing a common culture and language. They didn't live in cities, but on their land, and their architecture was inspired by nature. So instead of things being square and rectangular, they followed the curves of nature. You can see this in their jewelry and Celtic crosses. Another interesting feature of the Celts is that they worshipped without temples. All of nature was their temple. They also viewed the feminine as sacred. The land and the terrain of Ireland, for example, was a goddess, giving life to the people and creatures. The Celts knew that life was not possible without the feminine and the masculine, so they honored both, unlike most patriarchal societies of the time. Shortly after the death and resurrection of Jesus, a man by the name of Paul journeyed to some Celtic territory to spread the wisdom and the mystery of Christ. While some people found this teaching to be strange, the Celts did not. It wasn't at all strange to their worldview. Rather than being strange, Newell writes that the mystery of Christ gave further expression to the sacredness the Celts already knew that existed deep in the matter of the earth and in the stirrings of the human soul. The mystery and wisdom of Christ spread rapidly because the Celts weren't people of the book. They were people of story, story, of poetry, of song. It was easy for this new teaching to intermingle with what they already knew. And by the second century, there were Celtic Christian communities within the Roman Empire who worshipped in nature without temples and who refused to worship the emperor. Early Christians recognized Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, who lived approximately 140 to 202 CE. They recognized him as a member of the community that knew the Gospel of John, said to have been written by the Apostle John following the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and who then fled to a part of Asia Minor that bordered on Celtic territory of Galatia. The prologue to the Gospel of John matches Celtic spirituality. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The writer goes on to say that everything came into being through the Word. Everything was an utterance of the divine, a sacred sounding, and each creature and life form a unique and unrepeatable expression of the One. Christianity in the early centuries was made up of many communities with many ideas. Irenaeus spoke in favor of marriage and against celibacy. He looked around nature and saw that sexual relationships were an integral part of life's expression on earth. Sacredness had to embrace nature. Because of this view of the physical and nature being sacred, Irenaeus taught that Jesus was fully human and that the divine and the human were inseparable. Heaven is to be found in the things of the earth, including humanity and relationships. Irenaeus also spoke against the growing doctrine that God created out of nothing. He taught that the universe is born out of the substance of God, not out of nothing. In other words, the stuff of the body of the earth is sacred stuff. The earth, people, relationships, all these are holy and sacred. Those Christians who sought to align themselves with the power of the empire in these early centuries 
spoke against the teachings of Irenaeus. They said that the earth and all that is in it was made from nothing and therefore could not be sacred. This meant that the earth and humans could be used and exploited instead of being honored and cared for. The doctrine of ex nihilo taught that the substance of which the earth is made is neutral, not sacred. This set the stage for how Christianity was to be used again and again by empires over the centuries to sanction the exploitation of the earth and everything in it. Because of the second century doctrine of ex nihilo, we have been taught down through the centuries that none of this is sacred, none of this na of nature is sacred, and we can exploit what God has created. You can see the conflict between these two Christian groups. Those who sought to align themselves with the empire and gain power, and Irenaeus who taught that the earth and all of God's creation is sacred because it is made from God's self. But you know, even though Western Christianity has taught a betrayal of the sacredness, we know deep inside ourselves that everything is sacred. The wisdom and mystery of the Christ confirmed this. He taught the sacred essence of the universe, the resounding of the divine that is at the heart of all things. So it was into this tension that Pelagius was born in Celtic Britain about 360 CE. By the middle of the fourth century, Christianity had become the imperial religion of the Roman Empire. But Celtic Britain was on the fringe and resisted both the empire and the dominant teachings of Western Christianity. Pelagius was a monk in Wales who became the most misrepresented Christian teacher of all times who got to go head to head with Augustine and his doctrine of original sin. Pelagius had a five-fold focus on sacredness and we'll look at each of these today. The first is that Pelagius taught the sacredness of the human soul. God is our creator, and so we are born of God. But we can lose touch with the divine for all kinds of reasons, including our family of origin, our surroundings, addictions. If we are never told as a child that we have the divine within us, it can be a hard search to connect with God. But even though we may have slipped away from God, our sacred essence is always there. Through God's grace, we can reconnect. How does God's grace come to us? Pelagius taught that grace comes to us through creation. This is original grace, which is the gift of each moment of our lives. We feel this grace intensely when we experience the rising or the setting of the sun, beautiful flowers, and all that God has created. Pelagius also taught that grace comes to us through the cleansing of our inner sight. You've experienced this, I'm sure, when you've had an aha moment, when you realize that your behavior has been wrong, or you can now forgive someone. Forgiving someone or being forgiven is a huge moment of God's grace. So the first thing is that our human souls are sacred. The second thing that Pelagius taught us is that nature is sacred. The light that is in um, within all of life is within all creatures. It's not just humans that contain the divine light but all living things. Pelagius wrote that div the divine light comes from deep within every light. He said that if we look within God's, with God's eyes, nothing on earth is ugly. Because of this view, Pelagius challenged the Roman Empire to treat the body of the earth and its resources with reverence and that everything be shared equitably. Thirdly, Pelagius taught that we have to do the inner work of awareness so that our inner selves are fertile fields ready for the seed 
of God's word to grow. This inner work necessitated an Anamkara or a soul friend. We need someone to journey with us to help us with our inner awakening and awareness and to challenge us. Pelagius believed that we must have a soul friend to help us move up into greater consciousness and then translate this new awareness into action in our lives and our relationships in this world. This means that truth is not dispensed from above, but is found within each of us. We need to find that truth, and if it measures up with the teachings of Jesus, apply that truth in our lives and our actions. Fourth, Pelagius had a deep connection with the wisdom of the Hebrew scriptures. Wisdom was extremely important to Pelagius, so much so that he wrote that wisdom is the birthright of the human soul. So along with our soul being sacred, so is wisdom sacred and planted deep within us. Just like Pelagius recommends a soul friend or Anamkara to help us grow spiritually deep and then to live out what we have learned. He tells us that we are responsible for searching deep within for wisdom and bringing it up into our consciousness. Just as woman wisdom in the book of Proverbs calls to us to come and find her, Pelagius tells us to look for wisdom and to expect to find it way beyond the institutionalized church and in every culture, religion, and people. The fifth and final theme of sacredness in the writings of Pelagius is the sacredness of compassion. Why compassion? Because it is not so much what you believe about Jesus that matters. The important thing is becoming like Jesus, becoming compassionate. What does it mean to be compassionate? It means to feel the pain of the other as if it were your own. Jesus commands us to love our neighbor and for Pelagius, that meant not only humans, but all animals and birds, insects and plants among whom we live. We cannot do whatever we wish to the body of the earth, but are to honor it as we honor ourselves. Compassion is critical because it fuels the work of justice. Just as the light from the sun, the moon, or the stars are shared with all living things, so must the earth's resources be shared with all. The earth's resources are for the well-being of all, not just for the well-being of some. Today, this would include te technological resources, health resources, and food. Pelagius clashed with the empire on his ideas of the sacredness of the human soul, the sacredness of nature, the sacredness of spiritual practice, the sacredness of wisdom, and the sacredness of compassion. He was banned for the first time in 418 CE and then repeatedly banned for several hundred years. <coughs> Newell teaches that Pelagius is an icon for us today of reawakening to the sacredness of every human being. Interesting that the mightiest empire on earth banished him and the imperial church excommunicated him. But he couldn't be silenced and he still lives on. Pelagius, like wisdom, calls to us today to pay attention to what we are doing to destroy the five things he identifies as sacred. Let's sit for just a moment and think about how he has spoken to us today regarding the sacredness of the human soul, of nature, of spiritual practice, of wisdom, and of compassion. Let us pray. Awake, O oh my soul, and know the sacred dignity of your being. Awake to it, every living soul this day. Honor it, defend it, in heart and mind, in word and deed. Awake, O oh my soul, and know the sacred dignity of your being. 
Awake, O my soul, awake. Amen. And now we continue with um, more prayers, at which time you can bring to God those whom you are thinking of today. Let us pray. Glory be to you, O God, for the rising of the sun, for color filling the skies, and for the whiteness of day. Glory be to you for creatures stirring forth from the night, for plant forms stretching and unfolding, for the stable earth and its solid rocks. Glory be to you for the beauty of your image, waking in opening eyes, lighting the human countenance. Glory be to you. Glory be to you. And where the glistening is lost sight of, where life's colors are dulled, and the human soul grows hard, I pray for grace this day. I pray for your softening graces. I pray today for all creatures and areas of the earth that have been damaged and devastated by weather. I pray today for all who are suffering in body, soul, and mind. In this moment of silence, I invite you now to please pray for those who are on your heart. We pray for the coming day and for the life of the world. And as we leave this sacred space and journey into our day, we pray that in the elements of earth, sea, and sky, we may see your beauty, that in wild winds, bird song, and silence, we may hear your beauty, that in the body of another and the interminglings of relationship, we may touch your beauty, that in the moisture of the earth, its flowering and fruiting, we may smell your beauty, that in the flowing waters of spring and stream, we may taste your beauty. These things we look for this day, O oh God. These things we look for. Amen. So thank you for joining me this morning, and I hope to see you next week. Remember that you can join by Zoom on Wednesday mornings at 11.30 a.m. or watch this video on YouTube. I encourage you to get a copy of Newell's book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, and read along with me. So may God bless you this day and this coming week with all good things. And receive this Celtic blessing. On this day, may the blessings of heaven. On this day, may the blessings of earth. On this day, may the blessings of sea and sky open us to life, ground us in life, and fill us with life and with wonder. On those we love this day, and on every human family, the blessings of earth, the blessings of heaven, the blessings of sea and sky. Amen.